This is the lecture for the first part of the second section of Kant's Groundwork. This is going to be a long one. Uh, there's sort of two main topics of this lecture. The first main sort of topic, I don't know why I'm pointing at it, it's all the way on the right side of the screen, Kant's psychology. He sort of talks about how the will works in uh, this section, and it's a little technical and hard to keep track of, and uh, the reading quiz doesn't spend a lot of time focusing on it, so um, I'm just basically going to lecture on it, and that should help you understand what's going on there without having to struggle too much with Kant's uh, writing in this section. And then the second part is that uh, we'll talk a bit more about Kant's moral theory and how it works. And uh, this is going to be a long one because all of this stuff is pretty important. This is all sort of key to how Kant's moral theory works, and uh, it's a little hard to figure it out reading yourself. So we're going to do a lot of close reading of the text just so that we can figure out what is Kant saying, how do things work, what's going on here. So starting with Kant's psychology and what's going on. So we'll start on page 29. And so on page 29 is when he starts talking about how do we basically act? How do we make decisions? Uh, how is it that humans do things? And he says, okay, everything in nature works in accordance with laws. Only a rational being has the faculty to act in accordance with the representation of laws. That is, in accordance with principles or a will. So what he's saying here is that everything in nature is governed by laws, that's fine. So the law of gravity, for instance, is governing what rocks are up to. The scientific laws that describe photosynthesis uh, describe how plants work and things like that. What's special about rational beings is that we have a power that nothing else has. A rational being can sort of act in accordance with the representation of laws or in accordance with principles or a will. So what does this mean? Well, the most basic point to get here is that rational beings have a will. What is a will? What does it mean to have a will? Well, when you have a will, when you, you're a being with a will, you sort of, you're in control of yourself. Uh, a being with a will can make choices, so you use your will to make choices, and when you choose to do something, you do something. So if I will that my arm move upwards, my arm will move upwards. Of course, it doesn't always work. So if I'm paralyzed, I might will that my arm move upwards and it doesn't move upwards. But generally speaking, if you have a will, you're able to control your body, um, maybe some other stuff, sort of, you can use your will to influence the world in various ways. So we build tools which let us uh, sort of project our will across the world. So the basic thought is rational beings have a will. That's something special about rational beings. And the way Kant thinks the will works is that it works sort of in accordance with principles. So the way that your will does anything is that it doesn't just sort of act randomly um, or it doesn't act on urges or something. When you act rationally, when you use your will to do something, you're acting on some sort of principle. And what do these, do these principles look like? Well, we're going to see Kant's sort of picture of principles as we go on. But for now, all we need to know is the will is kind of acting on principles. And we'll get our first detail about the principles here in this sentence. He says, it's acting in accordance with the representation of laws. So a law is something that describes how things work. So the law of gravity describes how rocks fall. The laws of photosynthesis describe how plants turn sunlight and carbon dioxide into oxygen and energy and stuff. And so uh, various other laws describe how our will functions. Which laws are those? Again, we're going to see some examples later. But the way that the will works is that we act uh, in accordance with representations of laws. So we have ideas of these laws in our head. That's what a representation is. So we have this sort of idea of the law in our head, and we act in accordance with that law, and that's how our will works. So that's the broad picture. We have these laws in our head, or these pictures of the laws in our head, and then we put them into effect, and that's what our will is. And that's what we're going to see developed as Kant gives his picture of the will. So 
Since for the derivation of action from laws, reason is required, the will is nothing other than practical reason. So we have these laws or this representation of laws in our head, this picture of laws in our head, and to get an action from the law, we need reason, Kant thinks. So what are you doing when you sort of decide what to do, when you make choices? What you're doing is you're using reason or you're using your will. Your will relies on your reason. If you're not acting using your reason, then you're not acting using your will. And this happens sometimes. So if I hit your knee in the right place, it'll kick up. And that's not using your reason. That's not using your will. It's just a sort of automatic response. So that there's no representation of a law in your head that's causing you to kick up your leg. That's just an automatic thing. And other things that we do on instinct are like that. So if you smell something good and you salivate, uh, that's not your will doing that. That's just sort of happening automatically. There's no law in your head that's causing you to salivate. That just happens automatically. But when you make a sort of choice, when you make a decision, when you use your will to do something, that's working via reason. So you have the representation of the law in your head and you make a choice based on that law and that causes you to raise your arm or something like this. So he says, if reason determines the will without exception, then the actions of such a being, which are recognized as objectively necessary, are also subjectively necessary. That is, the will is a faculty of choosing only that which reason independently of inclination, recognizes as practically necessary, that is, as good. So this sentence starts with if. So this is a big if. He says, look, if reason determines the will without exception. So imagine reason is sort of deciding everything that you do with no exceptions. Everything you do is entirely through your powers of reason. Then the actions of such a being, so somebody like that, somebody whose everything they do is determined entirely by reason, which are recognized as objectively necessary, so we'll get to that in a moment, are also subjectively necessary. That is, the will is a faculty of choosing only that which reason, independently of inclination, recognizes as practically necessary, that is, as good. So if you're something that operates only on reason, Kant thinks, what you're doing is you're determining your will just by reason, independently of inclination. So what he has here is this idea, there's basically two things that can determine your will. There's reason and there's inclination. Reason is rationality. It's thinking about sort of what you should do using your sort of rational faculties. Inclination is just desire. It's what do you want. And these two things, Kant thinks, together, determine the will. So up here, when we were talking about the will as sort of working through reason, that's only part of it. Reason is playing a big role in the will, but so is inclination. Or at least that's how it works for humans. He says, if reason alone determines the will without exception, then what you're doing is you're sort of, uh, he calls it choosing a, a, a then the actions of that sort of being will be objectively necessary and also subjectively necessary. So they'll recognize what they should do with reason, and they'll always do that. That's the only thing determining their will. For Kant, no human being works like this. There is no human being for whom reason determines the will without exception. In all of us, inclination is playing some role in determining our will. We never do anything merely, or we never do everything merely because reason tells us to. Also, we have all these desires, and these desires are playing a big part in what we do. D desires don't determine everything we do. If we were like that, we would sort of be like animals, just acting on instinct, acting on our strongest desire. We're not like that. We have reason. That's what makes us sort of special. We have a will. But reason isn't the only thing going on. If reason were the only thing going on, Kant thinks, because rationality is sort of one and the same as morality for him, a purely rational creature will be a purely good creature. They'll be sort of uh, doing whatever they recognize as good, and rationality will recognize what's good, and so they'll just do the good thing. Um, 
and reason decides what's objectively necessary, and because reason is the only one in charge of the will, that's also what's subjectively necessary. So what's necessary for this creature to do is also what's necessary, sort of objectively speaking. Uh, what the creature feels like it needs to do is what the creature actually needs to do. They line up perfectly. Again, humans don't work like this, but Kant thinks uh, angels work like this, um, if angels exist. So they're sort of, that's, that's like the perfect sort of creature. That's not us. Anyways, but if reason for itself alone does not sufficiently determine the will, if the will is still subject to subjective conditions to certain incentives, which don't always agree with the objective conditions, in a word, if the will is not in itself fully in accord with reason, as it actually is with human beings, so this is a confusing parenthetical, he means this stuff, if the will is not fully in accord, that's how it works for human beings. So again, we're not always perfectly rational. We always have inclinations partially determining our will. So we're not perfectly rational. Then, so for human beings, the actions which are objectively recognized as necessary are subjectively contingent. So what you sort of objectively need to do, if you're thinking about it just with reason, those are necessary, like you, there's still what you need to do. There's still what you're required to do by, for instance, morality. But, so th those are necessary, but they're subjectively sort of contingent. They may or may not seem to you like what you need to do. And specifically, they may or may not determine your will. So what you end up doing might not be what's objectively necessary. It might be something else. You might do the wrong thing. That happens all the time for human beings. And the determination of such a will, so the determination of a human being's will, in accord with objective laws, is necessitation. That is, the relation of objective laws to a will, which is not thoroughly good, ours, is represented as the determination of the will of a rational being through grounds of reason to which, however, this will in accordance with this nature is not necessarily obedient. Lots of words, lots of confusing stuff, but the thought is, look, if we sort of parse out what this sentence means, it means, look, we might not do what we have to do. The sort of objective, rational law tells us what we have to do, but because we're not one of these creatures where reason just determines our will without exception, because inclination also determines our will, we're not always going to obey, and we're not always going to be obedient. So, what is, where do we go from here? Let's get more detail about how the will works. Why aren't humans always obedient? How does it work when we are obedient? How does it work when we aren't? The representation of an objective principle, insofar as it's necessitating for a will, is called a command of reason. And the formula of a command is called an imperative. So we have these principles, which reason sort of represents in its head. These are the laws, remember. And when we have the representation, so recall we have our, the, the will is the faculty to act in accordance with representation of laws. So we have the laws sort of out there. And then when they get in our head, they're a representation of the laws. He says the representation of an objective principle or of a law is called a command. And the formula of the command is called an imperative. So when the law sort of gets into your head, it's not just the law anymore. It's a representation of the law. Specifically, it's a command. The law is commanding you. And the form of the command is an imperative. So an imperative is, you know, it's a command. It's telling you to do something. So uh, pick up that chair and move it. That's an imperative. Um, you must not steal. That's an imperative. It's telling you what to do or what not to do. Those are imperatives. So these things in our head that reason picks up on and which we can use to determine the will, these are imperatives. All imperatives are ex expressed through an ought. So when I say pick up that chair and move it, what I mean is you ought to pick up that chair and move it over there. You ought not to steal, things like that. So you can always take an imperative and turn it into an ought sentence. All imperatives are expressed through an ought, and thereby indicate the relation of an objective law of reason to a will. So we have the objective law of reason, and how does it relate to my will? Oh, it's sort of, it's an ought. So the law says, you know, 
no stealing. And then how does that relate to my will? It says, you ought not to steal. It gives me an ought. So indicate the relation of objective law of reason to a will, which in its subjective constitution, so the will, the will's subjective constitution, the way the will is made up, is not necessarily determined by that law. So again, Kant says, we're not perfectly rational creatures who always do what reason tells us to do. We're not necessarily determined by the law. We're not necessarily determined by the representation of the law. We're not necessarily determined by the imperative. They say that it would be good to do or refrain from something, so the imperative, but they say it to a will that does not always do something just because it's represented to it as good to do. Again, we're imperfect human beings. We don't always do what it seems like us, what it seems to us we should do. So reason tells us, oh, you should do that thing. And sometimes we do it and sometimes we don't. The imperative sort of comes to us and sometimes we follow what we ought to do and sometimes we don't. Practical good, however, is that which determines the mean, or sorry, is that which determines the will by means of representation of reason, hence not from subjective causes, but objectively, that is, from grounds that are valid for every rational being as such. So practical good here is uh, morality, basically. So when Kant talks about good in this book, it's almost always moral good. It's like what the right thing to do is. So practical good, which determines the will by means of representation of reasons, hence not from the, objectively, from grounds that are uh, valid for every rational being as such. So here he's just saying, look, morality uh, sort of applies to everybody. It applies to all rational wills. So we've seen a bit of this already. If you think back to part one, where Kant says morality sort of depends on rationality, on reason. Since reason is the same for everybody, morality applies the same to all rational creatures. So he says practical good is our, uh, determines the will from grounds that are valid for every rational being as such. It, so morality, is distinguished from the agreeable as that which has influence on the will only by means of sensation from merely subjective causes. Those which are valid only for the senses of this or that one and not as a principle of reason, which is valid for everyone. So on the one side we have morality, that's based on reason, that works on everybody who's rational. Everybody has sort of imperatives from rationality, imperatives from morality, kind of in their will already, if they're rational. Then there's agreeable things, agreeable imperatives, or imperatives based on what's agreeable. And these are based on sensation, merely subjective causes. And so those are valid only for the senses of this or that one. So for instance, if you like the taste of samosas, uh, this might give you an imperative to eat a samosa. It says you ought to eat a samosa. Now that's not valid for every rational being, right? Some rational beings don't like the taste of samosas. Uh, some have better reasons not to eat samosas. And so that's not going to apply to everybody. So things that are merely agreeable are going to sort of be subjective, or they're going to be sources of imperatives subjectively for people, but they're not going to apply to everybody. Everybody has different things that they find agreeable in different situations. A perfectly good will would thus stand just as much under objective laws of the good, but it would not be possible to represent it as necessitated by them to actually, well, we're going to skip this. So this is discussion of how like the angel would work or how God would work, the being who acts only on reason. Uh, it's interesting stuff, but not super important. So that's the sort of basic picture. We have imperatives, which are representations of laws, and somehow they sort of determine our will. Our will is the operation of reason, but how, you know, how does this work specifically? Can we get some examples? You know, what's going on here? So now we move on to sort of part uh, two here, the sort of kinds of imperatives, hypothetical and categorical. So moving on to page 31. So he says, look, now all imperatives command either hypothetically or categorically. The former, hypothetical, represents the practical necessity of a possible action as a means to attain something else which one wills, or which is possible that one might will. So remember, how does the will work? Well, we have the law, and then we have the representation of the law through an imperative, through an ought. And that's 
uh, what's sort of determining the will. And so a hypothetical imperative represents the practical necessity of a possible action, so represents sort of a, the law of a possible action. So a law saying, for instance, uh, you know, move that chair or uh, lift your arm, any possible action, a law that just says do this thing. It represents that law of the action as a means to attain something else which one wills. So let's say you realize, oh, if I move that chair over there, I'll be able to sit down and watch the sunset. And maybe you want to watch the sunset. You, your will is willing to watch the sunset already. You've already decided you want to watch the sunset. So now you have a hypothetical imperative, which says, move that chair over there so you can watch the sunset. So the law says, uh, move the chair so you can watch the sunset. And then the ought form of that is you ought to move that chair so you can watch the sunset as a means of watching the sunset. So when you have a hypothetical imperative, basically that's saying there's something you can do, there's some sort of action you can do as a means to attain something else which you want to do. So that's a hypothetical imperative. You can do something to get something else that you want or that you will. The categorical imperative, so the other kind of imperative, would be that one which represents an action as objectively necessary for itself, without reference to another end. So the hypothetical imperative was something like move the chair so you can watch the sunset, or since it's an imperative, the law is move the chair to watch the sunset. The imperative is you ought to move the chair to watch the sunset. The categorical imperative applies no matter what you want. So without any reference to an end. So that would be just something like move the chair would be the law, or you ought to move the chair would be the categorical imperative. So it's not for some other reason. It's not as a means to an end. It's not so you can watch the sunset. It's just you ought to move the chair, or you ought not to steal, or you ought to raise your arm. That would be a categorical imperative, something that applies no matter what you want. So here, he basically repeats the point. Hypothetical imperative is sort of uh, representing uh, an ought which you do for some other sake, and a categorical imperative you do for its own sake, or as he puts it, it's good in itself. So it's something you do not for some other reason, but for its own sake. So move the chair is probably not going to be a categorical imperative, or you ought to move the chair. It doesn't really make sense to say you always should move the chair no matter what. Like that, that wouldn't be a categorical imperative. So a hypothetical imperative, it's very easy to come up with examples. So why should you move, or you ought to move the chair because that'll give you a good view of the sunset, or you ought to eat the samosa because it will taste delicious, or you ought to study for the test so you can get a good grade. It's much harder to come up with a categorical imperative, just something you ought to do no matter what. Like that's, it's, it's not clear what would fit into that category. Hypothetical, lots of stuff fits in. Categorical, not very clear. So he moves on, all sciences have some practical part consisting of the problems, whether any end is possible for us and the imperatives about how it can be attained so science studies, you know, what can we do and how can we do it? So can we create nuclear energy? And if so, how? You know, that's what science is up to. These, so this stuff, what's possible and how can we do it, can therefore in general be called imperatives of skill. Whether the end is rational and good is not the question here, but only what one has to do in order to achieve them. So science doesn't tell you if it's like a good idea to do nuclear fusion or something, or it doesn't tell you if it's a good idea uh, to build a house or something. Science just investigates how. How do you do nuclear fusion? Uh, or can you do nuclear fusion? And also, how do you do it if you want to? Like, what do you have to do to do nuclear fusion? Or what do you have to do to build a house? And science here for Kant is very broad. It's basically just all investigation into how the world works. So uh, there are all sorts of imperatives of skill in the sense of figuring out, like, if you want to do this, here's how to do it. So if you want to do nuclear energy, you ought to do these sorts of things. He thinks science just gives us lots of hypothetical imperatives of skill, which basically tell you 
how to do something, assuming you want to do it. So the precepts for a physician, how to make his patient healthy in a well-grounded way, and for the poisoner, how to kill him with certainty, are to this extent of equal worth, since each serves to affect its aim perfectly. So again, it's not about whether it's good or bad, it's just about how do you do it. So science tells us how do we make somebody healthy, science tells us how do we kill somebody, so it basically says, if you want to make somebody healthy, here's the list of stuff to do. If you want, or you ought to do this stuff. If you want to kill somebody, you ought to do this stuff. I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm just saying if you want this, this is what you ought to do. He thinks that's sort of how science works, it gives us a lot of stuff. Because in early youth, one does not know what ends he'll run up against in life. Parents seek chiefly to have their children learn many things, and they concern themselves about skill and the use of means, towards all kinds of discretionary ends, about none of which they can determine whether it will perhaps actually become the aim of the pupil in the future. So the thought is, oh, you know, we teach kids a lot of stuff. If you want to uh, you know, solve a math problem, here's what you ought to do. If you want to write a paper, here's what you ought to do. If you want to solve an economics problem, here's what you ought to do. Uh, all of this stuff. Are you going to need any of it? I don't know. Are you going to want to solve a math problem? Are you going to want to be an economist? Are you going to, I don't know. But, you know, let's just teach you a bunch of stuff so that if you ever want to do this stuff, you're able to do it. And that makes sense, right? You don't know what you're going to want to do in the future. So you want to acquire, basically, all of these skills that it takes to achieve these hypothetical imperatives. So if I want to do something, what do I, what is it that I ought to do? It's nice to know that sort of stuff. So that's basically hypothetical imperatives. And he says, now one can call skill in the choice of means to his own greatest well-being, prudence, in the narrowest sense. So hypothetical imperatives say if you want something else, here's what you ought to do. What if you want to be happy? Or what if you want to live a good life? What if you want your life to go well? Well, here's what you ought to do. And then list of stuff. What's the answer? I mean, that's not my job. Figure it out yourself. But knowing what it takes to make your life go well, that's called prudence. So if I can tell you what you ought to do, or if at least if I can tell you what I ought to do to make my life good, go well, I'm a prudent person. I know what I need to do to make my life go well. If you can figure out what you ought to do to make your life go well, you're a prudent person. Prudence is being able to figure out what it takes to make your life go well. So that's a hypothetical imperative. It says, if you want your life to go well, you ought to do X, Y, Z. And that's going to be different for everybody, right? There's not just one formula you can follow. Everybody has different sort of lives. So prudence is going to look different for everybody. So thus the imperative that refers to the choice of means to one's own happiness. So if you want to be happy, if you want your life to go well, that is the precept of prudence is always hypothetical. The action is commanded not absolutely, but only as a means to another aim. So prudence, making your life go well, you never do that for the sake of itself. You always do that for the sake of making your life go well. So prudence, knowing how to sort of live a happy life, that's always for something else, namely the happy life. You never, you're never prudent just for its own sake. So let's say it's prudent to brush your teeth, because that leads to a happy life. You're never going to brush your teeth just for the sake of brushing your teeth. There's no point. You only do that if it's going to promote your well-being, if it's going to promote your happiness. So prudence is always going to be a hypothetical imperative for Kant. Why is that interesting? I mean, there's lots of reasons, but um, if you think about Aristotle, for Aristotle, this sort of, like, for him, prudence is the sort of fundamental goal of morality. Remember, eudaimonia is our goal. It's the thing at which everybody aims. The nature of human beings is to aim at eudaimonia. And in fact, the nature of everything is to aim at eudaimonia. Every sort of thing has its own separate flourishing or goodness or blessedness or eudaimonia. So for Aristotle, every action aims at eudaimonia. So Aristotle would say every action you take is in accordance with this hypothetical imperative of prudence because it's good for you. Now remember, for Aristotle, a eudaimon life encompasses, uh, encompasses virtue, basically. So a eudaimon life 
is a life led uh, in a virtuous manner. So acting prudently for Aristotle, for your own sake, is not going to be selfish. It's going to involve helping other people and being a virtuous person. But ultimately, this is with the goal of eudaimonia, with your own happiness, your own flourishing. So everything you do for Aristotle is going to be according to this hypothetical imperative that Kant is talking about. And so one interesting thing we're going to see as we read the rest of the book is that for Kant, morality is not even about hypothetical imperatives at all. It's not about this hypothetical imperative that Aristotle thinks is central to morality. It's not about any hypothetical imperative. It's about this sort of mysterious categorical imperative. So that's the most interesting thing about hypothetical and categorical imperatives, which is for Aristotle, the hypothetical, the precept of prudence, which is always hypothetical, for him, that's everything about morality. Morality sort of fits into that, actually, because morality is virtue, and virtue is just a part of eudaimonia. So that pretty much finishes hypothetical imperatives. All the imperatives of skill are hypothetical imperatives. So if you want to solve a math problem, you ought to do that thing. That's an imperative of skill. If you want to write a paper, here's how you do that thing. That's an imperative of skill. Prudence is an imperative of skill and a hypothetical imperative of skill. And there's lots of other hypothetical imperatives as well. They're not all, well, I guess maybe they're all imperatives of skill in the sense that they teach you how to do something. But, um, you know, if you want to see the sunset, you ought to move the chair. That's like a very minimal skill. It's skill in seeing the sunset. But those are hypothetical imperatives. Now moving on to the mysterious categorical imperative, the one that applies no matter what you're trying to achieve, no matter what your ends are. It's just an end in itself, basically. He says, finally, there's one imperative that without being grounded on any other aim to be achieved through a certain course of conduct as its condition, commands this conduct immediately. So remember, remember, imperatives tell you you ought to do something, and this just says you ought to do it no matter what, not for some other sake, just no matter what. This imperative is categorical. It has not to do with the matter of action and what's to result from it, but with the form and principle from which it results. And what is essentially good about it consists in the disposition, whatever the results may be. This imperative may be called that of morality. Okay, so now we know morality is not, as Aristotle said, part of prudence. It's not a hypothetical imperative. It's a categorical imperative, and it applies no matter what results. And if you think back this makes a bit of sense. Kant has already said that the only thing that's good in itself is the goodwill. And the goodwill is good no matter what results it achieves. The goodwill is always good. And remember, the goodwill is a kind of will. And what is a will? A will is the faculty to act in accordance with the represent representation of laws, in accordance with principles. So a will is the faculty to act in accordance with principles. And what are those principles? They're, what are those, what are, what are the representations of the principles? They're the imperatives. So a will is the faculty to act on imperatives. A good will, we know for Kant, is the only good thing, and it doesn't depend on the results. So it kind of makes sense that if morality is about a categorical imperative, an imperative is about the will, and the will doesn't, the good will, doesn't depend on results. So we already kind of knew that this isn't going to depend on results. We still don't really know what the categorical imperative is. I mean, it's morality, I guess, but like, you know, how does this work or whatever. But we have the basic picture, which is we know what hypothetical imperatives are. If you want to do something, if you want to achieve some goal, here's what you ought to do. So those are pretty clear. We know what the categorical imperative isn't. It's not those. We know it applies no matter what. So no matter what you want, you, sh you ought to do this. That's what the categorical imperative says. And it's morality, and it doesn't depend on results. But, you know, what else? What, how does this work? You know, we're, we're confused at this point. That's fine. So, um, next topic. So we've covered hypothetical and categorical imperatives. Next topic is uh, how are hypothetical and categorical imperatives possible? So, um, ba, ba, ba. 
How an imperative of skill is to be possible probably needs no particular discussion. So Kant says, oh, this isn't too complicated. Whoever wills the end also wills, and so far, yeah, let's skip the parenthetical, also wills the means that are indispensably necessary to it that are in his control. So Kant says, okay, how are imperatives of skill possible? This is actually pretty straightforward. Anytime you set something as your goal, when you will an end, as he puts it. So what is it to will an end? Well, your will is sort of deciding what you're going to do. So if you decide, I want to accomplish this, I want to see the sunset. Let's say that's our end. The end I want to accomplish is I want to see the sunset. And I'm a rational creature, right? I'm not just acting on an instinct or something. I'm using my brain. So I want to see the sunset insofar as I'm rational. So insofar as reason has decisive influence on my actions, I'm going to will the means that are indispensably necessary to it, that are in my control. So I'm going to will the means. So if I want to see the sunset, I'm also going to will whatever it takes to see the sunset. But not just like whatever it takes, whatever is indispensably necessary to it. So if I need to do something in order to see the sunset, and I've decided I want to see the sunset, then I've also decided I want to do whatever it takes to see the sunset. Whatever it takes that's in my control. So I'm not going to, if I want to see the sunset, I'm not going to decide, oh, I'm going to like uh, cause the sun to set on my own when I want it to, and that'll let me see the sunset. That wouldn't be rational, because it's not under my control. It's only rational to use our will to decide things under our control. That's what the will does. It moves the body and other stuff that we control. So I can will that I raise my arm. I can't will that the sun set. So whoever wills the ends also wills the means that are necessary to it and that are in my control. So what's in my control? Well, it is in my control whether my arm moves, and it's in my control whether my arm attaches to the chair and moves the chair. So it's kind of under my control whether the chair moves. And if I need to move the chair to see the sunset, then if I will the end, seeing the sunset, then I also will the means that are necessary to the end, that are under my control. So that's how a hypothetical imperative works. If I have some end that I've decided on, then I've already decided on doing whatever it takes to get to the end. So Kant thinks that's pretty straightforward. So how is a hypothetical imperative possible? So as far as volition is concerned, as far as acting is concerned, this proposition is analytic. So this thing is analytic. So this thing is just sort of straightforward and clear, and it's sort of definitional. In the volition of an object, as my effect is already thought, my, uh, that's too confusing. <laughs> Basically just what I've been saying. So if I want to achieve some end, and I'm being rational, then I also want to do what it takes to achieve that end. So that's what a hypothetical imperative is. Not too difficult. Now remember the imperative of prudence. So doing what it takes to live a happy life. What, what, how, you know, how does that work? Imperatives of prudence would be equally analytic, equally straightforward, and entirely coincide with those of skill. So imperatives of skill are just doing what it takes to achieve the end. Imperatives of prudence would be just that simple if only it were so easy to provide a determinate concept of happiness. For here is there, it would be said, whoever wills the end also wills in accordance with reason, or necessarily in accord with reason, the soul means to it in his control. So look, you want to be happy, then you also want to do what it takes to make you happy. That's straightforward. But it is a misfortune that the concept of happiness is such an indeterminate concept that although every human being wishes to attain it, he can never say determinately and in a way that's harmonious with himself, what he really wishes and wills. So Kant says, look, all of us have an end, which is happiness. We all want to be happy. But it's just not straightforward what it takes to make us happy. I don't know what I need to do to be happy. I know what I need to do to see the sunset. I need to move the chair. So now I will that I move the chair. I just don't know what to will to make myself happy. He says the cause of this is that all the elements that belong to the co concept of happiness are altogether empirical. That is, they have to be gotten from experience. While the idea for the happiness, uh, while the, while for the idea of happiness and absolute whole, a maximum of welfare is required, 
in my present and in every future condition. Now it's impossible for the most insightful and at the same time most resourceful yet finite being to make a determinate concept of what he really wills here. If he wills wealth, how much worry, envy, and harassment will he not bring down on his shoulders? If he wills, cogni if he wills much cognition and insight, perhaps that could only give him a more acute eye to show him all the more terribly those ills that are now hidden from him and yet cannot be avoided, or to burden his desires, which already give him quite enough to do with still more needs. If he wills a long life, who will guarantee him that it won't be a long misery? If he wills at least health, how often have bodily discomforts not deterred him from excesses into which unlimited health would have allowed him to fall, etc.? In short, he's not capable of determining with complete certainty, in accordance with any principle, what will truly make him happy, because omniscience would be required for that. So he says, look, we all want to be happy, but we just don't know what it takes. Is it money? I don't know. Maybe that's just going to lead to envy and harassment and worry. Is it intelligence? I don't know. Maybe that's just going to reveal to you how much your life sucks. Or if, you, if you're smart, maybe now you want to learn a bunch of stuff in addition to all the other desires you have. Well, can I at least live a long time? I don't know. What if your life is going to suck for a long time? That might be bad. Well, at least I'll be healthy, right? I don't know. Maybe if you were unhealthy, you wouldn't give in to temptation or something. So he says it's just, it's really hard to find out what's going to make us happy. So here, he's kind of denying what Aristotle sort of was asserting in his whole project. Aristotle says, here's my job, here's the Nicomachean Ethics. I'm going to set out to find out what's eudaimonia, what is human happiness. And I'm going to give you a whole book and I'm going to explain human happiness. And Kant just says, you just can't figure it, like you just don't know how to be happy. It's just like, it's too hard. You were not omniscient. If you were omniscient, you could maybe do it. But we're not omniscient. We're limited human beings. It's just not clear what it takes to make you happy. So rationally speaking, it's just hard to figure out prudence. So we don't want to build ethics on prudence the way Aristotle suggested it. Aristotle's solution is, look, I don't know, let's look at all the evidence and figure out the best we can, and you just got to be really smart about it and use practical wisdom, and there's no specific rules I can give you, but, you know, figure it out yourself. For Kant, nope, not happening. By contrast, but here's some good news. By contrast, how the imperative of morality is possible is without doubt the sole question in need of a solution, since it's not at all hypothetical. And thus the necessity represented as objective cannot be based on any presupposition as with the hypothetical imperatives. So hypothetical imperatives, pretty straightforward to get. You want something, you have some goal. The hypothetical imperative is just whatever it takes to get to that goal. But remember, there's the categorical imperative, which is morality. And that applies no matter what goal you have. So now, how do we, how do we figure out what the categorical imperative is? Where does that come from? And he says, okay, well, we have to investigate the possibility of it entirely a priori. We never encounter it in experience and some other stuff. And so what the rest of the book, well, not the rest of the book, part three, we'll get there in a while. What part three is going to investigate is how is the categorical imperative possible? Like, how does it exist? How could there be a categorical imperative? That's an interesting question. We don't really know what it is and we don't know how it can exist. How can it exist? Part three. But now we're going to move on to part two. What is it? So that sort of concludes the Kant psychology part of the lecture. And we sort of now move back to morality because the categorical imperative is morality. And so when we're trying to figure out what is it and how can it exist, what is it is going to be this section basically coming up. How can it exist is part three. And so we're back into sort of classic morality. So that was a long lecture on Kant's psychology, but I'm going to move on and I'm going to take a drink. So it's easy to get a hypothetical imperative. You have the end that you want. The hypothetical imperative just says, do whatever it takes to get the end. Take whatever means it takes to get the end. You want to see the sunset, do whatever it takes to see the sunset. Very mysterious how we get a categorical imperative. What is the content of the categorical imperative? What is it you ought to do no matter what? 
no matter what you want. And so if you recall from an earlier lecture on Kant, I talked about, I think I called it the magic of Kant's answer or the brilliance of Kant's answer or something. I'm basically just going to explain that again because Kant's answer here, how do we get the categorical imperative? What is the content of the categorical imperative? Is going to be his sort of revolutionary answer to what is morality, which we've already seen. And so hopefully this will sound a bit familiar and when you hear it the second time, it'll maybe make more sense. So he says, look, if I think of a hypothetical imperative in general, just the idea of one, then I do not know beforehand what it will contain until the condition is given to me. So the condition is just when the hypothetical imperative applies, and that applies when the end exists. So if you want to see the sunset, you ought to move the chair. That only applies on the condition that you want to see the sunset. So a hypothetical imperative in general I don't know what it says until I know, you know, what is the end? So if the end is, I want to see the sunset, then the hypothetical imperative says, move the chair. But if the imperative says, I want to eat a samosa, then, you know, it could be something else. So just in general, just the idea of a hypothetical imperative, there's just nothing there. We need specific ends to get specific hypothetical imperatives. But if I think of a categorical imperative, then I know directly what it contains, he says. For since beside the law, the imperative contains only the necessity of the maxim that it should accord with this law. But the law contains no condition to which it's limited. There remains nothing left over with which the maxim of the action is to be in accord, and this accordance alone is what the imperative really represents, necessarily. So we're going to explain this twice, once without the word maxim, and then once after we figure out what a maxim is. So just without the word maxim. Again, hypothetical imperative in general, I don't know what it tells me to do. I need to know the end before I know the means to the end. What, what ought I to do? Well, it depends on the end for the hypothetical. The categorical imperative, it tells me you ought to do something no matter what. That's what the categorical imperative is. So you, what, could, what could it be telling me to do? What can I possibly do no matter what, what my ends are? Like, what, what could that possibly be? Well, here's what it could be. Only do something which you could do no matter what your ends are. So only do something which you need to do uh, sorry, I said only do something you can do. Only do something you ought to do, because this is an imperative. It's the form of an ought. What you ought to do is something, whatever you ought to do, no matter what your ends are. Again, this is just supposed to be like a redescription of the categorical imperative. I'm just saying it in different words. So you say, okay, well, what is it that I ought to do no matter what my ends are? Well, that's got to be something that everybody could do. Why? Well, if everybody ought to do it, or sorry, if, if somebody can do it no matter, if somebody ought to do it no matter what their ends are, then it's going to apply to everybody, right? If I ought to do something no matter what ends I have, then, you know, I can't escape the categorical imperative. It applies to me no matter what. And if it applies to me no matter what, it applies to you no matter what. It's something you ought to do no matter what your ends are. So it applies to everybody. So whatever the categorical imperative is, it's got to be something that could apply to everybody. It just tells you, you ought to do something no matter what. And it tells me that, it tells you that, it tells everybody that. So whatever the categorical imperative is, it's got to be something that everybody ought to do and something that everybody could do, no matter what their ends are. And Kant thinks, there you go, that's morality. That's the categorical imperative. It's something everybody can do no matter what, something everybody ought to do, no matter what their ends are. And there you go. How does this work? We'll see this later. But let's explain that again using this idea of a maxim. So what is a maxim? So I think this came up, I think, on the earlier reading quiz, so hopefully you sort of remember. But luckily he explains it again. He says it's the subjective principle for action or in the earlier reading quiz, you saw it called a subjective principle of volition. Volition and action just mean the same thing. Subjective principle of action. So a maxim is just the reason you do something. 
So when you act, you act on a maxim. It's the principle that you are acting on. It's a subjective principle. So it's your principle for action. So the maxim is what you're doing, and that's as opposed to the objective principle, the practical law. So again, the law is out there, and then it gets into our heads through representations. The representations are imperatives. When we act on those representations, when we act on the imperatives, we act according to a maxim. What is the maxim? It's basically just the subjective form of the law. So if I say you ought to move the chair if you want to see the sunset, my maxim is my principle of acting. So I will move the chair to see the sunset, something like that. So the maxim is the reason that you're acting. Why am I moving the chair? To see the sunset. So let's explain the categorical comparative with the idea of a maxim. So he says the, con the categorical comparative is thus only a single one. So interestingly, we started off with hypothetical and categorical imperatives, but it turns out there's just one categorical imperative. And specifically this, act only in accordance with that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it become a universal law. Why is that the categorical imperative? What, where, where is that coming from? Look, besides the law, the imperative, the categorical imperative, contains only the necessity of the maxim that it should accord with the law. So remember, the categorical imperative applies no matter what your ends are. So it says your maxims, or the categorical imperative, when it gives you a maxim, when it gives you the principle that you act on, the reason that you act on, it says uh, you sort of, this is a reason you have no matter what, no matter what your ends are. And there's no condition to which it's limited. So what can your reason sort of depend on? Nothing. It can't depend on any specific aim. So it can only depend on the idea that everybody could act on this reason. Because again, the categorical comparative is something that has to apply to everybody, no matter what. Because it applies no matter what the ends are. So any maxim in accordance with the categorical comparative, so any reason that you act on in accordance with the categorical comparative, is something, is a reason anybody else could act on. If it's not a reason anybody could act on, then it doesn't apply to some people. If it doesn't apply to some people, it's not categorical. Categorical means it applies no matter what to everybody. So the thought is, every time you act on a maxim, you can check. Is this a maxim everybody could act on? If it is, then it must be in accordance with the categorical imperative. It doesn't violate the categorical imperative. So it's moral. So this will make more sense as we sort of look at how it works. But if you're sort of a little confused, like here's one thing that might clear it up a little bit. So Kant is assuming here a principle, which I should uh, write down for you, called, whoops, not here, here. Ought implies can, and we often put little apostrophes around this. So the thought is, if I say you ought to do something, this implies that you can do it. Morality never says you ought to do something that you can't do. That would be kind of silly and unfair. So I can't say you ought to save everybody on earth from every natural disaster. That's your moral duty. Why? Because you can't. Like, that's this is impossible. Morality only commands things that we can do. So if you ought to do something, then it's got to be the case that it's possible. We can talk a lot more about this if you want. This, in fact, applies to hypothetical imperatives, too. And we actually saw that it applies to hypothetical imperatives when he said um, whatever is in your power or whatever, or something like that. But anyways, for categorical imperatives, this is important because, again, the basic check is that if you ought to do something, then it's something everybody, in principle, can do. Or, more specifically, it's not about doing. Remember, I say remember. That's something new I'm saying now. It's not about doing. It's about maxims. So if you ought to have a maxim, it's got to be a maxim everybody can have. Because ought implies can. So if you want to check a maxim, it's got to be a maxim 
that everybody could will, could have, could use as the determining principle of their will. Because the maxim is the subjective principle of action, so it's the thing that our will uses to decide what we do. So that's the sort of magic of, that's the answer Kant gives to what is morality. It's probably still very unclear because we haven't really seen a lot of examples of how this works. But this is what we want to have in our head going forward as we try to make sense of what's going on. Why is this so interesting and revolutionary? We'll see sort of as we fill out Kant's theory. But this is sort of a lecture about how does Kant get there. Next, uh, the categorical imperative doesn't blah, blah, blah. Okay, uh, page 3738. So that's the magical categorical imperative. Now, if from this one imperative, all imperatives of duty can be derived as from their principle, which is what Kant says. So he says, this is like the fundamental principle of morality. Everything flows from this. This one sentence is the fundamental principle of all morality. Okay. So if from this imperative, all imperatives of duty can be derived as from their principle, and he knows this sounds kind of crazy. Then, although we leave unsettled whether in general what one calls duty is an empty concept, we can at least indicate what we are thinking in the concept of duty and what this concept means. So he says, look, remember this question earlier, how is the categorical imperative possible? I've left it unsettled right now. We still don't know if there's such thing as morality, if anybody ought to do anything, morally speaking. But if there is, put that aside for a moment, just imagine there's morality, it exists for a moment. If there is, I've at least told you what it is. It's the categorical imperative. I haven't proven to you that morality exists. I've just proven to you this is what it's got to be if it exists. So one mistake people often make when they're reading Kant is they get sort of up through this point and he's introduced the categorical imperative now basically twice. We've seen this sort of fundamental principle of morality twice, once in part one and once in part two. And people read it and they're like, but I don't, I don't believe in this. So Kant, isn't Kant, Kant doesn't understand. This is just a joke. The thing is he's not trying to show that morality kind of like exists yet. He's just trying to say, if morality exists, this is what it is. Because if you think of the structure, we're moving from sort of common thought about morality to philosophical thought. Go back to the preface uh, for a redescription of Kant's strategy here. So we're not yet sort of vindicating morality. We're just trying to explain what is the common notion of morality. Let's like systematize it. Let's make it clearer. So if you're not convinced yet that morality is, exists, that's fine. Kant hasn't tried to convince you. What he's trying right now to do is something sort of more subtle. He's saying, if morality exists, this must be what it is. It must be this principle. And of course, that's probably unclear too right now, because like, what? how does this principle, like, why is this principle the whole of morality? That's confusing. But he's he's only biting off a little bit right now. He's saying, this is what morality is if it exists. I'm not saying it exists. So that's another interesting point. And he, uh, um, great. So immediately after introducing the categorical imperative for the second time, he gives four examples. So he says, now we'll enumerate some duties. And I'm going to give you sort of four examples of how the categorical imperative works. As I describe in the outline here, <laughs> they're sort of they're famously unhelpful examples, both for illustrating his point and for convincing people, especially the second one. A lot of people just find these very weak examples. Um, I think the third example is the best, but, well, no, the second and the third. Well, the sec I don't know. They're, they're, they're not perfect. It's, it's sort of hard to get what's going on with Kant here. So, you know, he's doing, I don't know if he's doing his best, he's doing something. Um, but the thought is, if you read through these examples and you're like, oh, I still am not sure if I get Kant, I'm still not sure if I find these convincing, don't worry too much. This is not like the best case you can make for Kant. So we'll talk more sort of in class and stuff and questions about, you know, what can we really say for Kant? So that's sort of this third point here, which is obviously do your best to understand them and see whether you're convinced or not. But, you know, recognize that maybe, maybe he could have done a better job in these four examples. One thing which the fourth example does bring out 
is one very important point, which is another way that people very, very often misunderstand Kant. So this is the final point we'll cover in this very long, I apologize, lecture. The final point is the idea of a contradiction in will versus the idea of a contradiction in, um, or versus the idea of like, what if everybody did this? So people read Kant and people read the categorical imperative and people read these four examples, but especially they read the categorical imperative and they say, oh, act only in accordance with that maxim through which you can at the same time will it become a universal law. Kant is saying, oh, what if everybody did that? And that's not an unreasonable thing to think. I mean, that's, I've almost like, I've kind of mistakenly described him as saying that in a few times in this lecture, I've caught myself and I've gone back, but Kant is not actually saying that. He's not saying, what if everybody did this? He's saying something more confusing. Only act in accordance with the maxim, which you can at the same time will that it become a universal law. So what is, what is going on here? What's the difference between willing that it become a universal law and imagining what if everybody did this? So this comes out, I think, in the fourth example. So in the fourth example, he sort of imagines somebody saying, oh, you know, it's a curmudgeon who says, I'm not going to help other people out. I don't want them to help me out. You know, people are just going to be as happy as they're going to be. Uh, you know, nobody needs, or nobody's going to get my help. And I'm not going to get anybody else's help. You know, that's how I'm going to live my life. And, you know, Kant has some stuff to say about that, which you'll find as you read. The only interesting thing we're going to look at here is that Kant thinks it's impossible to will that such a principle should be valid without exception. So he thinks somebody who tries to will this is not going to be able to. It's going to be impossible. So what does that mean? So remember, for Kant, he's interested in maxims. Maxims are subjective principles of volition. So what is a principle of volition? It's the reason you're doing something. So he's interested in reasons. Kant is testing your reasons. Morality for Kant is about the reasons that you act on. And this makes perfect sense if you think back to the very beginning of the book where he says the only thing that's good is a good will, or only thing that's perfectly good is a good will. He doesn't care about action. He cares about good will. A good will is something that's acting for the right reasons. In fact, he says, even if you don't accomplish your action, if you have a good will, you're good to go. I only care about the reasons that you're trying to act on, not about whether you successfully act. So we've already seen the sort of, I don't care about the action, I care about the will, I care about the reasons. And so what he's interested in is can you will a certain maxim? Can you will that everybody adopt this maxim? So what he's interested in is would it be rational for everybody to think the way that you are thinking. Now, because the way you think affects your actions, this will, this is kind of like saying, what if everybody did that? It's not like we will and then nothing happens. Usually we will and then we act according to our will. So if I will that my arm gets raised, usually my arm gets raised. If I'm paralyzed though, it won't, but usually we do what we will. If we get unlucky, we don't do what we will. So I might will that um, I hit the ball in cricket, but you know I get unlucky and I miss. So my will was I hit the ball, but in fact, I didn't hit the ball. Kant says what matters is what's in your will, not in what, you, what happens. But usually what we will is what happens. So when I test what if everybody willed this, that's what we test through the categorical comparative. Could I will that everybody, could I will that everybody act on this? Could I will that, sorry, could I will that everybody will this? Could this be a universal law for people? We are sort of imagining everybody acting on it, but really what we're imagining is everybody adopting your maxim or adopting your reason. And again, the reason is just inside your head. It'll affect what you do, but it's different. So Kant's moral theory is not this moral theory. What if everybody did that? It's similar, but it's distinct in one key way, which is he's interested in, can you will that everybody reason the way that you reason? Not act the way that you act, but reason the way that you reason. And in fact, sometimes you can't will that 
He gives four examples here where he thinks you cannot will this sort of thing. And it's not about what if everybody did this. It's about what if everybody had this kind of will. So don't get tripped up by that. That's a way of mistaking what Kant is saying. It's a very common way. It's an understandable way, but don't do that. It's not about action. It's about will. So with that, I end this very long lecture. Thank you for watching, and now go read uh, section two.